well as the others. Yes, Lord, yes. What a God. Yes, what a mighty God. My God. I have to tell you a little story about my sermon topic. Uh, my sister and I often bounce things off of each other and about Three weeks ago, we were on the phone as I was on the way back home from uh, taking my dad to the doctor and running some errands and cutting his grass. And we were bouncing some spiritual things off of each other. And my sermon topic came up in the conversation as we were uh, sharing some things, and I think I got three sermon topics out of that conversation. So you'll be, you heard one last week, and this week you hear another one. Uh, and we were talking, and in the conversation, I said, One thing we got to realize it's not our harvest. And I said, Oh, there's a sermon in that. And she said, You know. And so we both said we were going to, at some point, preach on that and we were going to compare notes of how we handled it so I don't know when she's going to deal with it but I couldn't hold out no longer I have to let her know I couldn't wait on her I got I, I just had to let this one out today um, the scripture coming of course from Matthew chapter 13 verses 24 through 30 but I also have to reference the fact that I need to preference the fact that we were given a great commission in Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20. And it is one of the, the pivotal verses in the Baptist church about going into all the world, baptizing them in the name of the Father and Son and the Holy Ghost, and preaching to all nations. And to summarize it, we are to go into all the world to preach, teach, and reach. Now, I'm going to leave you with a question today because one of the things, and I'm probably not going to be popular with a whole lot of preachers and a whole lot of churches around the world, because there's something that's going on in a lot of churches and a lot of legalistic places that grieves my spirit, and I'm going to say it, and I'm not going to stir, 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 stir. Because I'm going to ask this question because this is what I see happening with a lot of our so-called evangelical churches because I believe that a lot of churches are leaving what Jesus told us to do and beginning to try to do what Jesus is going to come back and do. My God. Here is my question. Where did he tell us to harvest his flock. Oh, y'all got real quiet there. So I want to examine what Jesus told believers to do. Now, we are quick to judge one another. But it seems to me I remember Jesus saying, Judge not, lest at least you be judged. By the same standard you judge, you shall be judged. Now, I'm not saying that 
we should say everything is okay. But as I mentioned in my sermon last week, our job is to, as the kids sang this morning, let our light shine. And I believe Jesus said, let your light shine before others so that they may see in you the works of God. See your good works and not glorify you, but glorify the Father in heaven. So in other words, there ought to be some Jesus in you that others can see that they might want to follow Jesus. Didn't say anything about judging and condemning, but letting your light shine so that somebody can see Jesus in you and want to follow you. And it doesn't say anything about worrying whether or not they accept it or receive it because he, he also told his disciples if they don't receive it, don't you worry about it. It's up to him. We do a lot of judging today. I see it in a lot of places. Yes, we do. I see it not only in churches. I see it in our government. I see it on every turn. We turn our noses up at one another. And we don't realize in a lot of cases, all it would take is one turn and we could be in the very situation Thank you. Thank as you. the folks we turn our noses up at. Tell it, tell it. My God. I remember a phrase I used to hear growing up there, but for the grace of God, go I. There's something to be said about that. But you know this, it, it, it's not anything that is so new. Because even in Jesus' day, Jesus got criticized because of the people he hung with. You know, nothing's changed. They still judge you by the company you keep. They did it to Jesus. They judged him because he ate and sat and fellowshiped with, as the Bible says in the King James English, publicans and sinners. And Jesus called out the religious establishment for it. He called them as hypocrites. And he called them out because they had the word and weren't going by the word. He called them out even though he was criticized for eating with sinners. But here's what Jesus did. He taught those sinners. He didn't judge them. He taught them, and they became saints. Yes, my God. My God. My God. My God. It's not my word. It's in the word itself. Look at the woman that was caught in the religious establishment. Drug them, drug her to him. To be stoned to death. We caught her. She ain't nothing but a loose woman. We caught her in the act. Now, I still scratch my head at this. All right, Pastor. I can't figure out how yes. you can have adultery with only one person. One person. One person. Hello? They picked and choose who they wanted to bring. Why didn't they bring the man or the men with her? If they were going by the Levitical law, they should have brought the man or men with her to be stoned. They brought the woman to trip Jesus up. And he says, okay, you're right. That's what the law says. Now, those of you without sin, Cast the first stone. Pick the stone up and throw it. You know what the word says. And he just began writing on the ground. Now, somewhere in there, the, the, the Jewish scholars were very modest in not saying what he wrote. 
It doesn't say what he was writing. Now, if they could be so specific in some things, but they didn't say what he was writing, somebody could read it. They probably just didn't want to write what he wrote on the ground. I dare say he was probably writing down the names of some of them that had been with the woman. He was probably writing down some of the sins that they were guilty of other than being with the woman and writing down their names next to him, writing down some of the laws in the church that they had violated and probably looking up. And so one by one, as he started writing down what they had done, one by one, they walked away. And then Jesus turns to her and says, woman, where are your accusers? I, 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 I see none, my Lord. I can just imagine this poor woman down there expecting this is going to be the last moment of her life. Here she stands. She's all cowered down, kneeling on the ground in front of the Savior of the world. Cowered down thinking in any minute she's going to feel the horrific pain of rough rocks and stones being thrown at her very viciously until she is dead. And she feels nothing. And then Jesus tells her, then I don't accuse you either. And he says, go and sin no more. That wasn't judgment, that was grace, and that was mercy. And I thought about how many times has Jesus shown each and every member of each and every church grace and mercy. Now, 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 now here's something else that hit me also, you see, this is the way God deals with me. Now, I know there's a whole lot of folks that probably think I'm a heretic and I'm on my way to hell. But you know what? I'm glad I know my Savior and I know otherwise. Because here's what I think about. You see, not only were they bringing her as, as judgment, but Jesus also, as he was writing, he was showing grace and mercy, not just to this woman, but when he was writing down the sins of everybody, and I believe that's what he was writing, he was showing grace and mercy to those religious leaders, the scribes and the Pharisees and the Sadducees who were there being self-righteous and saying, all right, here's your sin, here's your sin, here's your sin, and here's your sin. Oh, and here's your list of stuff. And one by one they walked away. And by them walking away, knowing that they were guilty of things that they could have been stoned for or worse, Jesus was showing them grace and mercy. And every day he shows the church grace and mercy. You see, the church needs to understand we are not perfect. But sometimes folks in the church want to think we are perfect just because we've been dipped in some water and we take communion once a month that that makes us perfect. No, that just reminds us that we are forgiven. Perfection will not be until we came come to the place where we stand before Christ with glorified bodies. This, this water reminds us that we have been buried with Christ and resurrected with Christ. And when we take communion, it reminds us that our sins were covered by the blood that he shed on Calvary. We were guilty, but God looks at us through the blood filter of his innocent blood. We were shown grace and mercy. My God. Thank you, Brother Pastor. Thank you. So, My God. he was criticized for eating with sinners, but he taught them how to become saints. Jesus told us to go into all the world to preach, teach, and reach. And that's what we ought to be doing. 
where in his word did he tell us to pull weeds out of his crop? Where did he tell us in his word to harvest his crop? Now, now there's something I, I learned a long time ago, see, because I love flowers and I don't like weeds. I love pretty green grass and I don't like weeds and I particularly don't like dandelions. <laughs> and you know, I don't care how much weed killer you put out, how much five, ten, and five you go along and put out in the yard. Here they come. And I have walked around my yard with weed be gone, and I've gone shh, 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 shh. And you know, dandelion weed roots go down three to four feet in the ground. And years ago, I had this little thing that picked out weeds and it used to go down just about that far in the ground and you could go around and pick out the dandelion and I'm thinking, oh, that got it. But no, all that did was chop off the top. But the root was way down in the ground. You'd pick it off and two days later, a new dandelion in the same spot, sometime two in the same spot. And you know, it just got to the place all you could do was just kind of keep it under control. And then I got to the place at one point, I was digging up great big holes in the yard. My dad said, son, uh, just let it go. Let it go. Just just get the little part right there because you're digging up too many big holes in the yard. What was happening? I was destroying good grass to try to keep the dandelions out the way. And then I learned that I was part of the problem in spreading the dandelions in the grass. And here's why. You ever seen what happens when dandelions go to sea, they turn white. And you know what, it, and I know these kids have done it because I've done it too. You pick the white dandelions and you do something to help it spread. We, and the little white things go out and it looks so pretty going out. And then they just, the wind carries them out over your Kentucky blue grass, your fine fescue, and all of your zoe grass, and the next thing you know, in about three to five days, you got dandelions everywhere. And when I read this scripture about who sowed the tares, we did it. Sometimes we sowed them by our lips. Sometimes we sold them by where we've gone because sometimes we don't always go where we should go. Oh my God. Sometimes we don't always say what we should say. Sometimes we don't always listen to what we should listen to or do what we should do. So sometimes we sow in seeds in all the wrong places. And then we complain and want to pull up the weeds and end up pulling up good crop too. It's not our place to do the harvesting. And Jesus never told us to harvest his crop. Not anywhere in the word did he tell us to harvest his crop. You see, at one point, all we can do is sow good seeds. But I found out something in cutting my grass. If I cut the grass regularly, if I just maintain the order of the good grass, you can keep the weeds under control. So what, the, what, what are you saying, Reverend? You know what, if, if I keep my life in order, if I keep myself in an attitude of prayer, that's like keeping my, my, my yard trimmed and cut in good order because then it keeps the weeds under control because 
I'm not allowing them to get out of hand. I'm not allowing the dandelion to go to seed because it can't spread unless it goes to seed. And in my flower bed, you see, sometimes I don't know good flowers from weeds. Because sometimes the weeds, when they come up, look just like good flowers. And sometimes weeds got the prettiest blossoms on them. And you just got the, the only way you know the difference between real flowers and weed flowers, you got to know good flowers. So what are you saying? You see, you see, what am I saying? The, what I'm saying is what we need to know is we need to spend time being close to the Savior because if we spend time being close to the Savior, we'll know the goodness of what good crop is. And we don't have to worry about the weeds because then we know what it is to be righteous. And then we'll know the difference between what's real and what's fake. And we have to understand it's not ours to harvest. Where did he tell us to harvest his crop? Nowhere. The answer is nowhere. It's not your harvest. What gives you the right to condemn anybody? We don't have a heaven to sit, a hell nor a heaven to send anybody to. If we just keep us, each and every individual one of us, before the throne and keep sowing seeds like he told us, then we're doing our job. Because I also found out something else in working in my flower beds and working around my lawn and in my yard. If I sow enough flowers in the flower bed, then I have no then I make no room for the weeds to grow. Because if you keep the flowers growing and you grow enough flowers in there, there's no room for the weeds to take root because there's no place for them to take hold and there's no place for them to get any light to grow. So you just fill it up with flowers. If you want, if you want to keep the weeds out, you just keep throwing out good grass seed. And if you throw out enough of it, it'll choke out some weeds. And there's certain grass you can put out that will automatically choke out some weeds. I found out something one day when my father decided that we were going to stop trying to fool around with rye grass because rye grass, sometimes you get weeds mixed in with the rye grass. And he decided, no, I'm going to put out some Kentucky blue right now. And then I'm going to get me some zoi grass patches. And zoi grass, when you step on it, feels like carpet. And I used to like to feel the, the feel of zoi grass under your shoes and, and under your bare feet. Now, I'm not a one for walking bare feet, but I like walking on bare feet in zoi grass. But zoi grass also kind of looks like a weed called crabgrass. But you got to know the difference because crabgrass looks like zoi grass, but it doesn't have the same feel. And you see, sometimes things look like salvation, but it don't have the same feel. Some things look like worship, but it don't have the same feel. Some things look like praise, but it doesn't have the same feel. And the only way to know the difference is you just got to get in it and step in it and, and feel it for yourself. And when you get in it, you know, ah, oh, this ain't right. No. Run, Forrest, run, because this ain't right. But I noticed one thing. My dad put out some some zoi grass patches and he started off in the front yard and he put out a patch that wasn't much bigger than this and we just put it out and next thing I know that patch got to be this big and then the patch got to be about as big as this area right here the next thing I know that patch was all over the front yard but the only thing I remember after that the zoi grass got so thick that wouldn't any dandelion grow in it wouldn't any crabgrass grow in it? The other thing I found out, though, it was a struggle to cut. Sometimes... 
to get what you need in the Lord, it's going to be a little struggle. Nothing comes easy. Sometimes you've got to push and press toward the mark to get where you need to go in the Lord. Because sometimes I'd have to take that push more when that, when that zoi grass would get thick and I'd have to push and struggle and the sweat would run. But oh, when I got the grass cut, it looked so pretty and it felt so good under my feet. But you know, it was so nice because I didn't have to worry about the ugliness of the weeds. And you know, when I think about our relationship in the Lord, all we have to do is keep sowing seeds of righteousness. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Oh, yeah, there's a lot wrong in the world. There's a lot of sin in the world. And I could go and I could name a whole lot of things that people have their pet peeves about. You know, a couple of years ago, the big pet peeve was abortion and people still talking about that. Now we got a new pet peeve and there'll probably be other pet peeves along the way. But you know what? God is still God. Oh, yes. And if we are worried about those things, we can't worry about us trying to stop it. All we've got to do is teach what God's word says. Teach what God's word says. If you just teach what God's word says and God says his word will not return unto him void. No, everybody's not going to accept it, but somebody is. And the somebody that does accept it is going to tell somebody else. And the somebody else that accepts it is going to tell somebody else. And you know what? If somebody else is keep telling somebody else, eventually some of the weeds that are pushing the negativity and the things that aren't right, eventually it will get choked out. Yes, sir. Yeah, you know what? That just like we went to sleep and we allowed prayer to go out of the schools, now everything else came in. Whose fault was it? Ours. We went to sleep and allowed it to go out. Now it's time to wake up and start sowing seeds again. It's time to wake up and start praying because you might not be able to pray publicly in the school, but can anybody stop you from doing this? Don't you tell me they can tell you it's wrong to silently bow your head because when you bow your head, any time of the day in your job or school, they can't, they can't tell you you can't do it. You're not uttering anything out loud, and a prayer is a prayer whether it's uttered out loud or silently. My God. My God. And even the very one who got it to the Supreme Court and it got kicked out of school is gone, and guess whose son got saved? Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. It happened. And you know why it happened? Because some seeds got sown in the midst of the weeds that were in that house, and that person got saved. Amen. Amen. Praise God. My God. And we have to understand if we just keep sowing the seeds of righteousness, eventually the weeds. We'll get choked out. Yes. And yeah, not all of them are going to get choked out. But see, one day, what the world doesn't realize, there's going to be a harvest coming. And you know, with all of the farm equipment they got out now, and I, I watched and I learned something out here when I moved here. You know, it used to be a time when everything was done by hand. Corn was picked an ear at a time. And they got a machine that goes along now and it goes down a couple of rows at a time and the next thing it know, it pulls up at the time of harvest, it pulls up whole stalks 
and that thing starts going along. Next thing you know, you got ears of corn going off this way and then stalks going out the other side. And next thing you know, his his bales of stalks all over here and something else comes along and crushes it up for silage for the animals to eat. And I'm going, oh, my goodness. Now, how did that machine know to separate the ears of corn and the stalks over here? And it seemed like it didn't leave a one laying around. Somebody invented a machine to pick cotton, which some of our ancestors had to do by hand. And that stuff has little barbs on it and it got big seeds in it and it would pick the cotton. And then they got a machine to turn the cotton and pull the seeds out. So when you go get them little cotton balls, you don't have no barbs, you don't have no seeds, you don't have anything in it but pure cotton. The harvest is coming and one day Jesus is coming back. And he, when he comes back, he's going to be the one to do the harvesting. And he's going to be the one to separate the tares or the weeds. And he's going to be the one to separate the good crop. And the good crop are those that are saved. And all I'm saying is make sure that you are not a weed. Make sure that in your life you are anchored in the solid rock, which is Jesus Christ. Make sure that you are washed in the blood of the yes. Lamb. Make sure that you are not one still going around going to the dandelion. Make sure that you are sowing good seeds. Don't worry about the who's going to do the harvest because Jesus is the one that's coming back. And when he comes back for the harvest, just make sure you're gathered up in the basket of the righteous so that when he gathers you up, you will hear him say, well done, thy good and faithful servant. Come unto me and enter into my rest because then that day comes then all of the weeds that have been troubling then choking out the righteous all of the weeds that have been troubling and making life miserable for the righteous one day he's going to gather them up into a bundle and they won't be used for silage to feed anything but the fires of a burning hell how do I know this because I've read the end of the book and it says that the devil and all of those imps with him were cast into to the lake of fire that's where they will go where while we are gathered around the phone it thrown it's not your harvest but the harvest belongs to the Lord let him do the harvesting and we just plant the seeds My God. Thank you, is there one is there one and I just wish every church would stop worrying about what the world's doing. Because the world's going to be the world. As I mentioned last week, the world ain't saved. The country ain't saved. There are people in the country that are saved. And the reason things are no worse than what they are is because we are, there are saved folks here that are still praying. We just need to keep sowing seeds of righteousness. Don't worry about them. Let them do what they're going to do. They are the world. The world's going to do what the world's going to do. You just keep living for Jesus. And even more so now as the end draws near, let the world do what the world's going to do. You just live safe. You can't change a hogus nature. My God. You just live for Jesus and let him harvest his crop. And you just be a part of that because it's not your harvest. Is there one? Won't you stand?